Hey, everybody. Welcome to week 11 of PS398. Hope you're all doing great. Hope you're all well rested and, and, and feeling ready to get this semester finished up. You know, it's weird. Whenever I start one of these stupid videos, I find myself with this strong instinct to, to try to, I don't know, give you some energy or something. And I find myself just walking around my house, just telling people, good job. You're doing a great job. My wife is very tired of me just walking around saying, you're doing a great job. Even Chewy, you know, I take him, I let him outside. He does the thing that he does out back. And I'm like, nice work. You're doing a great job. Whenever we take Chewy for a walk, I see people around the neighborhood and I'm like, hey, you're doing a great job. Hey, you're doing a great job. Hey, you're doing a great job. I just find myself giving pep talks all the time. More and more of you have been coming to office hours, not just with questions about your problem sets, but also just to say hi. And I kind of feel myself saying, hey, great job. You found the energy to come to office hours. You clicked some link on Zoom. Oh boy, that was hard. But even that feels hard right now, right? I just kind of find myself walking around saying, great job, great job, great job. Just pep talking everybody because I am genuinely impressed by the energy that you find to keep pushing. It's really weird. I see so many people out there. I see so many of you that I'm impressed by, by how hard you're working and how hard you're pushing and how consistent you're doing. I find myself just saying, great job, great job, great job. I find myself giving pep talks all the time to the point that it's begun to influence how I talk. It's begun to influence how I think. I feel like I'm less a college professor anymore and more just somebody walking around saying, hey, great job. It's even begun to haunt my dreams. I had the strangest dream last night. I went to bed and I was myself. But then I woke up and I found myself in a chair somewhere in South Florida. And it kind of went like this. Okay, students there at PS398 at the University of Illinois. Uh, this is Coach Dave Wanstead, former coach Wanstead of the Chicago Bears, Dolphins, a few places, now with Fox Sports. And uh, Rob reached out to me and uh, was giving me some information on your online classes and that you're coming down the finish line. And this is a critical time, just like in any sporting event, any class, any challenge, you have to finish strong. And, you know, the NFL, I don't know if you're aware, they did not have any in-person camps leading up to the season. A little bit like what you're going through. And everything was online. And it really came down to everybody was talking about the, the team, the players, talking to you, the students, that approach this in a positive way, in the right way, and take advantage of it are the team or the students that are gonna benefit in the end and win. And so I think it's that's gonna be the key. You know, whether you're graduating next year, or the year after, or three years, or whatever, uh, take advantage of this time because there's students at other universities that you're gonna be competing with that probably aren't. And look at the positives. I mean, you, you, you shouldn't be missing classes, right? I mean, if you were on campus, who knows? I mean, you know, I've coached at a lot of universities. I know it's sometimes those early classes are tough to get up for. No excuses, that's a positive. You don't have to run from one side of campus to the other and get all stressed out. Everything's right at home. You should be able to get a hold of your professors. A lot of times when you're in there in person, you know, they don't have time. They're on to the next class. But now it's, it's you can say things now probably that you normally wouldn't say get behind that uh, computer or that iPad or whatever and uh, and kind of, you know, let them know what you're thinking. So there's a lot of positives. And uh, again, hey, the key is finishing strong. You do something different that your competition when you graduate is not doing. That'll make all the difference. And then I realized it was all a dream. And I noticed that when I woke up in my own bed here in Urbana, Illinois, suddenly I was wearing this t-shirt. This isn't the shirt that I wore when I went to bed. And I don't know what it all means. Special thanks to head coach Dave Wanstatt, formerly of the Chicago Bears, Miami Dolphins, Pitt Panthers, and so on and so forth. And very few people that are higher on my I wish I could meet them list than head coach Dave Wanstead. I'm not a Bears fan, that's why. So in the previous lecture, we introduced the notion of time to our, to our extensive form games. We said, well, the simultaneous move structure that we developed to study the prisoner's dilemma and chicken 
and Assurance and all these other games, it's great. It helps us to get some introductory logic about what the underlying tension in a given interaction is. But it isn't super duper realistic in many settings because there's this notion that sometimes somebody gets to observe what somebody else did, whether they're playing chess or figuring out where to place their troops somewhere on a battlefield. You know, things aren't necessarily simultaneous all the time. Many times there are, but sometimes they aren't. And once we incorporated a notion of strategic time into our theory of games, once we started to go from matrices to finger games, things got a little bit more intuitive and also very interesting. Now that's just on the storytelling side. We didn't do any analysis last week. It was a lot like the games lecture when we started strategic form games. I just wanted to show you what it is to tell stories where time is an important element in the story. And so today is part two of that, where I want to start to talk about what analysis looks like. And it turns out that there's going to be a very important substantive concept that is the defining characteristic of analysis of extensive form games. It's a very important concept in international relations and other fields in political science and elsewhere in the social sciences, a notion of credibility. I landed on credibility pretty hard at the end of last week's lecture in the hopes of dovetailing pretty well into this one. And then I had that strange dream and then suddenly all of the dovetailing was gone, but it was worth it. The idea of credibility, the idea of making a threat or a promise or a guarantee or signing a deal or an, uh, writing down a contract that's, that's believable, where the idea is that in the future, which is when the contract matters, like I said, we can always sign a contract today, that's easy. But under international anarchy, writing down a deal is alone insufficient. Uh, rather famously, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck referred to alliances as mere scraps of paper. What is it to write down a deal that is sufficiently self-enforcing that I have faith that you're going to live up to it tomorrow under international anarchy where there is nobody to enforce contracts. What is it for us to write down an alliance promising to protect one another? If somebody attacks one of us, then we will declare war on them together. What is it to make an economic deal? I will reduce my tariffs and you will reduce yours and we will do that for a long time. What is it to issue a threat that you will believe tomorrow? If you cross this line, then I will attack you. So once we introduce time, we need to think harder about what it is to make rational choices under time. What, what kind of predictions are we going to make? How do we make predictions that take advantage of the time structure inherent in an extensive form game? Now, I'm saying that somewhat strangely. You might be thinking, what do you mean take advantage of the time structure? Well, I mean something very particular. I mean, how do we take a game that has potentially many equilibria and then try to get rid of those equilibria that don't seem plausible if we think about time? In other words, we're going to take our underlying notion of Nash equilibrium in strategic form games, in matrix games. We're going to take the stars analysis that we've already done up to this point to say, this is a mutually rational prediction. And then we're going to say, well, if I have three equilibria like in chicken, and then I figure out that one of the drivers is allowed to observe what the other driver did. Once I do that, then it should become very easy for me to reduce those three equilibria down to one or at least to reduce the set of equilibria. So how do I take my predictions, which may have been indeterminate when I didn't think about time, how do I take them and then use that to refine my prediction system to come up with a more precise set of predictions, a more determinate set of predictions, potentially even a unique prediction for any given model. So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about credible commitment. I want to talk about what it is for us to analyze in a way that doesn't allow for any bullcrap. How do we analyze in a way where we don't take seriously equilibria that don't take advantage of the underlying time structure? How do we look only for those deals that make sense? In order to do so, I'll show you a refined concept called subgame perfect equilibrium, which just refines Nash equilibrium to allow for time structure to matter. And I'll show you an algorithm for finding subgame perfect equilibria in relatively introductory games like what I've shown you up to this point, the backward induction algorithm. More often than not, when somebody is talking about studying an extensive form game, they're talking about using backward induction. We'll see next week that that alone will be insufficient for studying credible subgame perfect equilibria sort of things. But in most settings, working backwards, looking down the tree and working backwards will be the way that we go. To the point that before we get started, I want you to write in your notes. If you know when the last day is in some interaction, if you know when the last day is, if there's a deadline that's credible, a credible deadline, not a deadline that we set that we're allowed to go through, but a real deadline, some institutionalized deadline. If I'm a baseball team, I know all my trades have to be done by July 31st, or I did it under the old rules, right? If the United Nations says the two countries have to come up with some deal in, uh, in, in some amount of time, if there's some third party enforcing a deadline, if you know when the last day is, 
Go there and work backwards. Go there and work backwards. Backward induction is a, it's, it's something that you probably already do a little bit in your brain. We're going to reinforce that today, and I, I never want you to stop. Always do backward induction. You have a big choice in your life, use backward induction. You don't know what to do after college, use backward induction. Backward induction is a really important thing for you to learn about. And you're going to see it. You're going to get a lot of different examples of it today. You're going to see backward induction from a lot of different angles. And so I hope that you come out of today's lecture ready to do a problem set. Yeah. But ready to go out there and make tough choices too. So I have lots to show you and I already killed two minutes on a bad dream that I had. So let's get to it. In the A block, I'll show you how to use backward induction to study our simple model of deterrence. We'll study it from, I'll, I'll parameterize it two different ways so that you can see what credible means and what credible doesn't mean. Uh, we'll, we'll think about what it could be to shift an outcome and say under what conditions does one outcome happen versus under what conditions does some other outcome happen. So I'll use this simple straightforward model of deterrence to show you what you need to know about backward induction, credible commitment, and subgame perfect equilibrium. We'll juxtapose time respecting analysis like backward induction with time not respecting analysis like converting the game to its strategic form complement. So I'll show you all the Nash equilibria of a game and then show you that the backward induction surviving profile is a Nash equilibrium. We'll see that all subgame perfect equilibria are Nash equilibria, but not vice versa. We are truly refining our predictions. In the B block, I'll show you all the wrinkles that the infiniteness of the ultimatum game puts into this. We'll study the ultimatum game using backward induction. We'll see that we have to be a little bit clever. We have to be a little bit smart. We have to be a little bit flexible and nimble and all the things that you're supposed to be. That's gonna be a little bit tricky. It might take a couple of times for you to see it. The ultimatum game, it's one of those things where you see that we have to accept the mathematical objects that we're using, warts and all. There are some parts of the, the ultimatum game that, like, don't make perfect sense when we do subgame perfect equilibrium on them, when we use backward induction. However, once we're smart, once we're clever, it's not that bad. And you'll see that you can take the ultimatum game and extend it in many different ways using the same simple tools of analysis that I'll show you today. And then finally, really just to drive home our concept of subgame perfection, we'll study the rule of law game that I showed you last week. It's almost like last week there was a reason for the games that I showed you. Um, and we'll see that subgame perfect equilibrium is totally doable even once we take information sets into account. We just have to be smart and flexible and all the things that you're supposed to be. So if you enjoy the stories from last time, I get the sense that you're going to enjoy finding the endings of those stories this time. This is a, a style of analysis that I really hope sinks into your head. Don't let it fall out of your ear when you go to bed. This is something that this is going to be really useful for you. And once you start to analyze this way, you'll never unsee it. And that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So I'm really looking forward to showing this stuff to you. Let's get started. So here in the A block, we're gonna study that simple model of deterrence that I showed you last week. So you remember in this simple model, we have two states, state A and state B. And so what happens is at the beginning of time, state A makes a choice. They can either do nothing and accept some status quo outcome, or they can issue a threat to state B and say, hey, I'm coming for you, give me some stuff. If state A doesn't do anything, then we find ourselves at a status quo outcome. So that'll be a terminal node. However, if the, if the threat is issued, then state B can either acquiesce to the threat or say, you know what, bring it and say, let's fight. For the purposes of this introductory example, I'm going to change the utility numbers slightly from where they were last week. So I'm going to say, if there's a status quo, just like last time, if, if we wind up at the status quo, then we'll give state A zero happiness points and state B one happiness point. If state B acquiesces to a threat after state A issued it, so state A issues a threat and state B acquiesces, if that happens, I'm going to say that state A gets one happiness point and state B gets zero happiness points. Finally, for the war outcome, I'll say minus one happiness points for both states. State A and state B both get minus one happiness points. So zero, one, one, zero, and minus one, minus one. So before we analyze this game in a time respecting way, the first thing I want to do is show you that this game has two pure strategy Nash equilibria if it was played simultaneously. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this to a matrix game real fast, and then we'll find the Nash equilibria. So suppose that state A is the row player and state B is the column player. State A can either issue a threat or do nothing. And state B can either acquiesce or fight. 
So if state A doesn't do anything, if, if they don't issue a threat, then no matter what state B does, no matter what state B does, it's zero, one. It's zero happiness points for state A and one happiness point for state B. So I'll put a zero, one at don't threaten acquiesce because you're not acquiescing in anything. The only thing that gets observed at that point in time is the fact that we're at the status quo. And I'll put zero, one for don't threaten fight. However, if state A issues a threat, then that means that state B's choice matters now. So if state A issues the threat and state B acquiesces, then that means one happiness point for state A and zero happiness points for state B. Finally, if state A issues a threat and state B says bring it, then that's minus one happiness points for state A and minus one happiness points for state B. Now let's just find all the pure strategy Nash equilibria of this strategic form version of our little baby deterrence game. I'll just put some stars in here. If state A knew that state B was going to acquiesce, then state A would issue the threat. So I'll put a star underneath the one for threat and acquiesce. And if state A knew that state B was going to fight, state A would not issue a threat. So I'll put a star underneath the, the zero for the status quo. Zero beats minus one for war. How about state B? Well, if state B knew that state A was going to issue a threat, remember, we're doing this simultaneously now, so they don't get to observe anything. When we're in a matrix, state B doesn't observe anything. So if state B had to treat the threat as a hypothetical, if they knew that a threat was going to happen, they would rather acquiesce. So I'll put a star underneath the zero happiness points that they get for threat and acquiesce. And if they knew that state A wasn't going to issue a threat, then they don't care. They're indifferent. So I'll put a star underneath both of those ones because it's a status quo outcome no matter what. So no matter what they do, they get one happiness point. So I'll put stars underneath both of those ones. You'll notice that this game has two pure strategy Nash equilibria. It has one at threat and acquiesce and another one at don't threaten fight. Per your intuitions, there may be some mixed equilibrium, and in fact, there is a mixed equilibrium, which I would encourage you to go find in the comfort of your own home if you want to for good practice. So there is a third equilibrium. As I promised you, almost all games have an odd number of equilibria. So what I want to say to you is that one of these equilibria in the context of the time structure inherent in our game tree makes sense, and one of these equilibria does not make sense. So let's think about what these equilibria look like in the tree. So I'm going to call the threat and acquiesce one the blue equilibrium. So in the blue equilibrium, this is what happens. State A issues the threat and state B acquiesces. So I'll just make these two edges blue. And then the history takes us to the utility numbers one zero. The orange equilibrium on the, on the other hand is the one where state A doesn't do anything and state B fights. So in the, in the orange equilibrium, state A does not issue a threat. And then in the purely hypothetical world that we never get to, in the purely unobservable hypothetical world that would have happened if a threat was issued, but because one wasn't issued, it's purely hypothetical. In this purely hypothetical world up here, state B fights. In the orange equilibrium, state B deters state A from issuing a threat because state A is it worries about the war. State A is saying, you know what? You want to fight that war? Minus one is no good. I'd rather take the status quo. So in the orange equilibrium, deterrence has happened. So we have a blue equilibrium where a threat is issued and, and that threat is, is acquiesced to, and an orange equilibrium where nothing happens, but in a hypothetical world, a war happens. Now, I told you that one of these things makes sense in, in res with respect to this time structure, and one of them doesn't. And so I encourage you now to pause the video and tell me which equilibrium, the orange equilibrium or the blue equilibrium, which one of them seems to make sense with respect to time and which one doesn't. Pause the video. Like, literally pause the video. Pause the video. Do I have to, do I have to get Coach Wanstat back here? Pause the video. Welcome back. So this orange equilibrium doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. This orange equilibrium doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Why? Because right now, what's happening in the orange equilibrium? Let's get rid of the blue one. So what's happening in this orange equilibrium? So what's happening is State A isn't doing anything. They're saying, you know what? I'll take the status quo because I am worried that if I issue a threat, now think about this counterfactual is thinking. State A is saying to themselves in this equilibrium, if I issue that threat, then state B is going to fight. And I'm going to wind up getting the minus one happiness points of having to actually get into a fight with this country that I was just trying to issue a threat to. Now here's a question. Why the hell would state A think that? Look at state B's utility numbers. 
If State B, if we get to State B's decision, they can either acquiesce and get zero happiness points or fight. Apparently, they don't want to fight because they get minus one happiness points. Why would they choose to fight? They're the ones that would be deciding that the, that the war gets started. They're the ones saying, bring it. Why the heck would they choose to fight a war that they don't want? That's not credible. They wouldn't do that. So why would State A think that they would do that? Why would State A think that State B is going to start a war that they don't want to start? That's not credible. That's not a credible. Th That's not credible. It's not credible. It's not believable. If State B said to State A at the beginning, you know what? You can play this game however you want to, but I'm telling you, I'm going to fight. So you better not issue me any threats. Why would State A believe that? Why? Because at the end of time, State B has to put their money where their mouth is. That is not a reasonable thing to be worried about. Why would State A be worried about that? It's not going to happen. Why would you start a war that gets you minus one happiness points? When you could acquiesce and get zero happiness points. There is no ambiguity about what State B wants to do. So why would State A think about that? Why would State A ever fear a war that wouldn't start? They wouldn't. Now, in the blue equilibrium, we have no such problems. In the blue equilibrium, what's happening in the blue equilibrium? Well, well, State A is issuing a threat and State B is acquiescing, which is what they would prefer to do if push came to shove. So even though these are both Nash equilibria, only one of them seems to respect time. Only one of them seems to respect the time structure inherent in this game tree. What we did when we wrote down this game tree is we said State B gets to observe what State A does and then makes their own independent choice in full cognizance of that. No hypothetical is required. Only one of these equilibria seems to make sense. Only one of these equilibria makes sense in the context of the tree. Now notice, I can come up with an algorithm that gets to that, the aforementioned backward induction algorithm. So let's just, let's just make this, let's suppose that we just came to this tree again. Suppose that I wanted to only find equilibria that made sense. Suppose that I only wanted to find equilibria that respected time. Well, what I would do is I would go to the end and I would say, okay, this is your, this is the final decision. This is the final decision. Let's see what they would do. And then I'll go, I'll go back in time and I'll see what they would do. And then I'll go back in time and I'll see what they would do until I'm at the beginning of time. And that's backward induction. So let's see how this works. So in order for this algorithm to work, what we do is we say there's two kinds of nodes. Now it's not terminal and decision nodes. Now we say there's two kinds of nodes, solved nodes and not solved nodes. And so the idea is at the beginning of the algorithm, every terminal node is solved and every decision node is not solved. So what I'll do is I'll take these three terminal nodes and I'll just, I'll put solved on them. And now you know that they've been solved. These nodes count as solved. And this is just to keep the algorithm clean. If you're like, how, what does it mean for a terminal node to be solved? You'll see what I mean here in a second. So then what I do is I try to find decision nodes that are followed only by solved nodes. So now that I've got some solved nodes, now I say find decision nodes that are followed only by, immediately followed only by solved nodes. So let's think about our two decision nodes. Right now I've got state A's decision node and I've got state B's decision node. Notice that state A's decision node goes to one solved node, the terminal node of the status quo, and one unsolved node, state B's decision. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna start from state A's decision. I'm only gonna start with things that, that are followed only by solved nodes. Notice that state B's decision node is followed only by solved nodes. There's the terminal node after they acquiesce and the terminal node after they fight. So it's followed only by solved nodes. And so that's where I'm going to begin my analysis. Go to a decision node that's followed only by solved nodes. And then figure out what the decision maker in question would do there. So in this case, state B can either acquiesce and get zero happiness points or fight and get minus one happiness points. They would rather acquiesce. So we're going to say at this decision node, they would rather acquiesce. And so I'm going to highlight this edge. I don't even have to worry about the situation where they fight. They would never choose to fight. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put that one down. I'm gonna consider state B's decision node solved now. Why? Because I know what will happen there. I might as well just take this one zero from the acquiescence outcome and put it right underneath state B's decision node because right now state A can view that just as a terminal node because they know what state B is gonna do in the future. That's it. That's it. 
We have we have handled state B. We're done with state B. We know what state B is going to do. They might as well not be in the game now. Now state A just has a decision problem. State A has a decision problem because state A can either not issue a threat and get zero happiness points, or they can issue a threat on the correct expectation that state B will acquiesce if threatened. If threatened, state B will acquiesce. And so they don't have to worry about this. They, they know that if they issue a threat, acquiescence will happen and only get one happiness point. Well, they would rather issue the threat. And so I'll highlight the edge for issue the threat. I don't have to worry about the, the, the don't issue a threat world. That's not going to happen. So now I, I've identified what was the blue equilibrium. I've identified the situation where state A issues a threat and state B acquiesces. I got that from this backward induction algorithm. One continues this until every decision node is solved. And so now that I've solved state A's decision node, every node in the game, all three terminal nodes and both the decision nodes have been solved. I am done with the algorithm. And you'll notice that the algorithm has identified exactly the blue equilibrium. It's the situation where state A issues a threat and state B acquiesces. That's a Nash equilibrium. It's the Nash equilibrium that seemed to make sense after we thought about time. So this is a sub-game perfect equilibrium. You'll see what I mean by that in a fuller sense once we get to the C block. But as of right now, I have identified a Nash equilibrium where every decision made by a decision maker is credible with respect to where it is in the time structure inherent in the game tree. We took one Nash equilibrium that required believing in incredible threat. The orange equilibrium required state A to expect something in the future that was not rational there. It didn't satisfy intertemporal rationality concerns. It was not a credible threat for war to deter state A from issuing a threat. Now here's a question for you. Suppose that I wanted to get to the orange equilibrium. Under what conditions is something like the orange equilibrium, under what conditions is deterrent, does the threat of war deter a threat? Under what conditions? If I could change this model in one and only one way, if I could change one and only one utility number, change, keep the structure the same way that it is. Apparently, this is the structure that the game tree is. This is my hand's impression of the game tree. So keep the game tree as it is. Keep the structure of the interaction as it is, but change the utility numbers a little bit. If I could change one and only one of the six utility numbers on the screen right now so that state A doesn't issue a threat in equilibrium, what, what change would I make? What one change could I make that would, that would shift what happens from the blue equilibrium to something that looks like the orange equilibrium? What change would I make? One and only one change. Pause the video. Would it be something about state A? Something about state B? And for whatever your answer about that was, would it be something early or something late? What would you change? What one thing would you change? If we wanted to get no threats, how would I make it happen? Pause the video. Welcome back to the two of you that paused the video to go to the bathroom. So I could do it a couple of different ways, but probably the simplest way is to say acquiescing makes state B get minus two happiness points instead of zero. I need to make acquiescing worse than fighting for state B, and that will change state A. See, if I'm, if I'm smart, I can make a change about state B, and that will change state A. I'll take advantage of the rationality that's lurking underneath this whole thing. I'm going to take advantage of what's happening in the behavioral hypothesis that breathes life into our game. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, state B, if they acquiesce, instead of getting zero happiness points, they get minus two happiness points. Now let's clear the whole thing. Perform backward induction. Here we go. Notice that I've got three solved nodes in the, in the form of the terminal nodes. Notice that state A is not followed only by solved nodes because it's followed by state B, just like before. State B's decision, on the other hand, is followed only by solved nodes, so I should begin there. So here we are at state B's decision. State B can either acquiesce and now get minus two happiness points or fight and get minus one happiness points. They would now rather fight. So I'm gonna highlight the fight edge. So I'll highlight that fight edge. I don't have to worry about the acquiescence outcome. I can just whoop, get rid of it. I might as well take that minus one, minus one and put it over underneath state B's decision node. State B's decision node is now solved. So now I've got three solved nodes in the form of the terminal nodes. I've got state B's decision node, which is now solved. I need to find a decision node that is followed only by solved nodes. Well, there's only one decision node left. Notice that it's state A's decision node. If they issue the threat, then it goes to state B's decision node, which is now solved. Or it goes to a terminal node if they don't issue a threat, and that's solved by default. 
So I go to state A's decision node. And now I'm thinking through. State A can either do nothing, get the status quo for sure, and they get zero happiness points. Or they can issue the threat knowing that state B will now fight. And if state B fights, then that gets state A minus one happiness points. So you can either do nothing and get zero or issue a threat and get minus one. You would rather do nothing. So now we find ourselves at the orange equilibrium. That's the situation where state A does nothing and state B fights in the purely hypothetical situation. So this is a message that I want to send to you very directly. What happens off of the equilibrium path? What happens away from the path? Right now we have a path. The equilibrium path begins at the beginning of time and it goes right to the status quo and that's the end of the story. And you might think that that's the whole thing. No, not so. In order for that to be the equilibrium, we have to have thought through the purely hypothetical contingency of what would have happened if state B got to make a choice. What happens in hypothetical worlds reinforces what happens in the world that we're experiencing. That's heavy when you think about it, right? In particular, it is not an equilibrium for state A to do nothing and state B to acquiesce in the hypothetical world. You're like, it doesn't matter because we never touch it. Oh no, it matters. Because what would happen if state A deviated? If state A deviated to issuing a threat and then state B acquiesced, then state A would get one happiness point. So they want to deviate. It has to be the case that what you expect in the future reinforces the decisions that you made today. So in other words, a strategy has to be a complete contingency plan. What would you do? What would you do? What would you do? Even though only some of those choices are going to be choices that wind up being made. We have to know what every choice would be. Otherwise, we don't know if what happens in hypothetical worlds reinforces what happens in the world that we're experiencing. So that's what backward induction buys us. If you know when the last day is, you can just say all of the last day nodes are solved and then go to the day before the last day and see what would happen. Consider that solved. And then go to the day before the day before the last day and see what would happen in expectation, knowing that the day before the last day is solved and the last day is solved and so on until you're at the first day. Go to the future. Look down the tree. Think only about credible threats. Don't waste your time thinking about incredible threats to stop you from doing something you want to do. There's nothing credible about somebody choosing a war that they don't want to fight. That's what we're talking about here. The thing that flips the switch from the orange equilibrium to the blue equilibrium and vice versa. The believability that state B will fight when push comes to shove. And then how that reinforces state A's decision which precedes it. We might never observe the thing that stopped war from happening. We might never get a chance to see the wars that stop the threats. There's, a, there's an infinite number of hypothetical wars that have never happened, but that have reinforced the history that we observe. There's a reason that I got so meta last week. It very much is that what happens in hypothetical futures influences today's decisions. If we're making the behavioral hypothesis of rationality, then we might as well get everything we can out of it. We might as well say that if state B is the, is the final decider of things, then we should only worry about state, what state B would do there. What would be their incentive compatible thing to do in the future? Don't worry about things that aren't rational for them to do there. Don't worry about non-sequentially rational play. Now we're not just thinking about rationality, we're thinking about sequential rationality. I don't know if I should go this way or this way, but either way, it's sequential rationality. Sequential rationality. If you're telling rational stories and you incorporate time, then you might as well think about sequential rationality. And that's what backward induction is all about. So this is pretty straightforward. On your problem set, you'll get a couple of other games. I'll give you audience cost and centipede to work through. Uh, but it, it's just this algorithm, a little bit more extended because there's more decision nodes to think through. But opt-out games are particularly straightforward when you're studying them in this backward induction -y sort of way. So don't be afraid to come back here. Don't be afraid to trust your instincts. This is a good time to trust your instincts. Trust them hard. Now, I'm going to warp all that once we start talking about the ultimatum game over in the B block. So I'll see you there.
So here in the B block, I want to talk about the ultimatum game, which means that that creepy guy is about to come back on the screen. You know, so what happens whenever I'm buying the stock images? Like, I go to, I use Adobe stock, right? So I go to Adobe stock and I'm like, stock image for ultimatum game. Apparently when I type things in, first of all, I type like this apparently. And I say stock images, I, I speak only in falsetto when I'm typing. Stock images for ultimatum game. And this is the one that came up. And then my job is to sort of orange and blue it a little bit. Ultimatum guy terrifies me. I'm terrified of ultimatum guy. But sometimes you have to make deals with ultimatum guy. So now, instead of making uh, a single binary choice, threaten or don't threaten, like in the A block, now state A chooses some X that lives between 0 and 1. So they choose some X between 0 and 1. We got pretty good at that, right? After that X, then state B observes the X. State B observes the X, and then can either accept or reject the offer that state A made. And we'll say that if state, a, if state B accepts the offer, then it's X for state A and 1 minus X for state B. Otherwise, it's D sub A and D sub B. Remember that for this to be a bargaining problem, we were operating under the assumption that DA plus DB is less than one, so that the, the disagreement utilities yield less happiness than the agreement utilities in, in, in the sum. So let's just make this super stark for now. Let's say that if state B rejects the offer, zero happiness points for state A, zero happiness points for state B. Now let's think this through. This is hard because let's do backward induction. Let's do backward induction. So I'm going to consider all terminal nodes of this game solved. All terminal nodes. I've drawn two terminal nodes in the abstract, but think about it. Suppose that state A offered x equals 0. That goes like this. And then state B has a decision where they can either, where it's either x and 1 minus x, which is then 0 and 1, or 0 and 0. So there's, there's a decision that state B has to make when x equals 0. There's a separate decision that state B has to make when X equals one. That's, that changes the, the, the utilities for agreement to one and zero instead of zero and one. If X equals one half, then there's a decision for state B to make where it's either accept and get one half, one half, or reject and get zero, zero, and so on. There's actually an infinite number of decisions for state B to make. I'm gonna consider every terminal node in this game solved. Now I have to find decision nodes. I have to find decision nodes that are followed only by solved nodes. Well, state A, no matter what X they choose, it goes to a decision node by state B, which is not solved right now. So it's not state A's decision, it's state B's decision. But think about all of the decisions that state B has to make. State B has to make decisions when X equals zero, X equals one, X equals one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, one sixth, two thirds, two fourths, two fifths, two sixths, three fourths, three fifths, three sixths, three sevenths. And that's just all the rationals. There's also all the irrational ones in there. There's an uncountably infinite number of decision nodes for us to study for state B. Uncountably infinite. So what are we going to do? Are you going to say, well, Rob, you handle all the decision nodes between zero and one-tenth. And then you'll handle one-tenth to two-tenths. And Chewy will handle two-tenths to three-tenths. And Chancellor Jones will handle four-tenths to five-tenths. But even then, let's say that we just went to my little slice of the pie. We said, okay, Rob, you handle everything between zero and, and one-tenth. X equals zero and X equals one-tenth. Well, how many numbers are there between zero and one-tenth? An uncountably infinite number. I have the same problem. It's turtles all the way down. You might not know that expression. So an aside on turtles all the way down. I, as you know by now, I like mythology a lot. In, in Hindu, in, in many, uh, there's a lot of Hindu mythology. And so in some parts of Hindu mythology, there is this belief that there is a world turtle. Sometimes it's turtle, sometimes it's elephant. I'm not going to get into this, but this, the idea is that there's a, there's, a, there's a turtle and that the world is on top of a turtle. There's a, there's a big turtle and we're all on it. So I, I'm probably not going to get all the details right, and I suspect that many of the details are apocryphal. But So here's a version of the fable. This isn't exactly how things went down, but here's a fable that'll get you to, to see where the problem comes from. So some very fancy academic was giving a talk somewhere, and she was studying something like the origins of the universe or something. So she's giving this talk. Let's say that it was somewhere in India, because this is a branch of Hindu mythology. This is part of Hindu mythology. So she's giving a talk somewhere in India about the the... 
the origins of the universe. And she's got the Big Bang, there's science, blah, blah, blah. All those things that we know that I don't know that much about. So after she's done giving her talk on the origins of the universe and the Big Bang, an old woman goes up to her. And the old woman has a smile on her face and she says, well, I really want to thank you for giving such a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot, but I just find myself laughing at what you're saying. And the uppity academic, of course, was like, well, how dare you laugh at me? I'm so smart. I'm so fancy. Academics don't like to be laughed at for the most part. So she said, well, why are you laughing at me? And the, the little woman says, that, well, that isn't, that isn't what, how the world works. The world is on the top of this giant turtle. The, the, the world is on top of this world turtle. And the academic is trying to be, is trying to be charitable and says, uh, well, that's, a, that's nice. That's nice. But what is the turtle on? And the old lady laughs again. And the academic, not, like be, not enjoying being laughed at, says, well, why are you laughing at me? And the, and the old woman says, well, the turtle's on top of another turtle, you idiot. And the academic says, well, what's that second turtle on? And, and the old woman starts laughing, and she's like, apparently you don't know the whole story. It's turtles all the way down. The earth is on the world turtle, and the world turtle is on some other turtle, and the other turtle is on some other turtle, and so on all the way down. Similarly, with the subsets that I'm working with here, if I have an uncountable set of numbers between 0 and 1, if I have an uncountable set of decision nodes for state, a, for state B to, 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 to make, if I have a an uncountable, a massively infinite number of decision nodes to study for state B, and then I take, some, I take one tenth of it, I still have an uncountably infinite number of decision nodes to study. So maybe I took one tenth of that. Instead of one to one, 0 to 1 tenth, I'll go 0 to 1 hundredth. I'll take 1 tenth of 1 tenth. But then I would still have an uncountably infinite number of decision nodes to study for state B. So maybe I would take 1 tenth of 1 hundredth and have a thousandth. And I would still have an uncountably infinite number of decision nodes to study. It's turtles all the way down in my Assassin's Creed hoodie. What? So how am I going to study this? I promised you overacting. How am I going to study this? How? How am I going to study this? Well, I'm not going to be able to do it one at a time like I did in the A block. I'm not going to be able to say, well, I'll go to state B's decision, solve it, and then go to state A's. Because I don't have one decision node to solve the same way. I don't have one decision node or even a finite number. If it was a finite number of decision nodes, I could say, solve all of state B's, and then when you're done, handle state A. Right? I could do that. If, it, if I had a spaghetti hoodie instead of a hoodie, if I had a spaghetti hoodie, and let's say that there was a trillion, let's say there was a trillion decision nodes for me to study, I could do that. I could say, okay, for every one, listen to me say, for every one of the trillion decision nodes that state B has, figure out which one they prefer, solve it, call that node solved, and then when they're all solved, handle state A. I could do that if it was a finite amount of spaghetti. No matter how massive the number of spaghetti strands there is, there's no way that's a good sentence. No matter how many strands of spaghetti I find in my Assassin's Creed hoodie, grammatically correct, substantively wonky, but let's just go with it. No matter what, I could do that. But once I have a full-on Assassin's Creed hoodie, there's too many for me to handle. I need to think about another way to do this. Just think about it. It's, it's actually a fun thing to think about. Suppose that we decided that we were going to crowdsource this thing. We said, okay, the way that we're going to handle the ultimatum game is everybody on Earth, every one of the billions and billions of people on Earth, is going to be assigned one little sliver of the Assassin's Creed hoodie. Everybody gets a sliver. Here's my sliver. Here's your sliver. Here's Chewie's sliver. Here's everybody's sliver. The problem is, even though we have taken this job and broken it down into billions and billions of sub-jobs, even though we've made every one of these jobs as tiny as humanly possible, they're still huge. So we need another way. We need another way because we got to solve this thing. This is one of the most important games in international relations. This is one of the most important games in all of game theory. How are we going to solve this game? So what I need, because I don't have the time to solve all these infinite decision nodes. I know you'd like me to try because that would mean that for the next five weeks, all I would be doing is, and I go to the next one and I solve it. And I go to the next one and I solve it. I could do that forever. 
and I wouldn't get any closer to solving the problem. What I need is a way to take offers, X's, to take X's, and then turn them into accept or reject decisions. I need a way to automate this process, not in a handle them all way, but in a handle them all way. In my mind, that made sense. I don't mean solve them one by one in an automated way. I mean theoretically automate the process. I need, a I need, I need some way, a decision rule for state B that reads in offers and spits out accept or reject. Spits out. Spits out. Spits out. Spits out. I say that sometimes. Whenever I say... Reads in one thing, spits out another. Reads in one thing, spits out another. It takes in an offer and it converts the offer to an accept-reject decision. It takes an offer and it converts it to accept-reject. What does that? What does that? What? Speak up. Speak up. Speak up. A function. What an inspired idea inspired. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. So right now, I'm going to say that state B's strategy in this game, it's not enough to just handle one X. I need to think about every X because that's every possible hypothetical world. It's not enough for me to study one X. I need to think about every X. So I need to think about state B's decision rule, not what they make at each decision, because that's not enough. I need to know all of the decisions Holistically, the whole of their decision rule is more than the sum of the parts. So I'm going to call this, let's call it S sub B of X. It reads in some X and it spits out accept or reject. Right? That makes sense. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Now, I'm going to simplify this process incredibly. And in, it's going to be a multi-step procedure, but I'm going to make this very simple in one step. So consider the following thing. Notice that if X is strictly less than one, so for most of the X's, for all the X's other than this one at one, for every X other than this X, for every X other than X equals one, that means that state B is deciding between one minus X, which is strictly greater than zero, and zero. So they would rather, they would accept any deal. They would accept any deal, right? They would accept any deal where X is strictly less than one because that leaves some pi for them and some pi is better than what they get for disagreeing, which is nothing. Right? Makes sense. So for all those, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say S, S sub B of X, in, in case X is less than one, it's gonna be accept, it has to be accept. They would only accept in those situations. However, what happens if X is exactly equal to one? What happens if state A says, you know what? I'm keeping all the pi for myself, I like pi. State A and I have a lot in common. So what happens if that happens? If state A says, you know what, screw you, I'm keeping everything for myself. Then what? If X is exactly equal to one, now I've got another decision node to study and state B is now choosing. They can either accept and get zero happiness points, one minus one equals zero happiness points, or they can reject and get zero happiness points. They are indifferent. They are indifferent, they don't care. They don't care. They don't care. They don't care. State B does not care. They could accept and get zero. They could reject and get zero. They could mix if they wanted to and get zero, but let's just study the pure strategies. They could accept or reject. They could accept or reject. So in other words, when I, when I study S sub B of X, if X is less than one, it has to be accept. And if X is equal to one, it could be accept or it could be reject. And we have to study both contingencies. We have to find all possible equilibria. So we'll have to think about both of those. We have to consider both contingencies. So suppose first that state B is the kind of country that rejects if X equals one. Suppose that if you, if you offer them no pie, they can either accept no pie or reject no pie. And they're like, you know what? Screw it. I'm rejecting you out of spite or something. So suppose that state B rejected one indifferent. Suppose that state B rejected one indifferent. We have now solved all of the uncountably infinite decision nodes for state B. We've handled X equals zero, X equals one, and everything in between. Right now we are good. We have solved all of state B's decision nodes. We have handled every decision node that is followed only by solved nodes. We can now go to the top of the game. So here we are at the top of the game. Now let's think about what state A wants to do. Let's consider their utility for issuing any possible X 
What would happen and what's the best X for them to choose? Right now, state A is saying, which offer would I make now that I know that state B will accept any offer less than one and reject if X equals one? Let's think about state A's utility. Let's put this in space. So let's just put X, let's put their offer on the horizontal axis and let's put the utility that they would expect to get now that they know state B's strategy. Now that they know state B's strategy, let's think about what they can expect, what would be their utility now that they know what state B is going to do. So suppose that X equals zero. Suppose that they say, you know what? Keep all the pie. Well, if X equals zero, that's less than one. So state B accepts and state A gets X equals zero happiness points. That's right here. Let's say that they offer at X equals one quarter. They say, I'll keep a quarter of the pie. You take three quarters of the pie. The pie is, is land. The pie is the, is the gains from trade. The pie is something that these two countries care about. So they'll say, you know what? I'll take one quarter of the land. You take three quarters of the land. Well, we know one, X equals one quarter is less than X equals one, and therefore state B would accept that. State B would accept that because that's the only sequentially rational thing for them to do. So state B would accept it. That would mean that state A gets X equals one quarter happiness points. If, if state A offers X equals one half, it would be accepted, and state A would get one half of a happiness point. If state A offered three quarters, and they say X equals three quarters, I'll keep three quarter, you take one quarter. That's still more than the zero that state B would get if they rejected. Therefore, state B will accept. And state A will get three quarters of a happiness point. So they're getting happier and happier as we climb this mountain. They're just getting happier and happier as we climb this mountain. X equals three quarter, accepted, you get three quarters. X equals seven eighths, accepted, you get seven eighths. X equals 15 sixteenths, accepted, you get 15 sixteenths. X equals 31 30 seconds, accepted, you get 31 30 seconds. It's getting better and better as we go. X equals 255, 256, it gets accepted, and you get 255, 256 of a happiness point. It just keeps getting better and better. X equals one, rejected, zero happiness points. You fell off the mountain. Boop. So it's better and better and better and better and better and better and better until you get to X equals one and that's a plop. So what should, what should stay day choose? Which X should stay day choose? Which X maximizes this function? If you could choose any X to try to make this go as high up the mountain as possible, which X would you choose? You would have to find the largest number Strictly less than one. Can you think of such a number? Let's say you thought you did. You come up to me and you're like, Rob, I have found it. I have solved your problem. It's called a toupee. No, you've solved the other problem that I have. That you say to me, okay, so I've got, let's call it, let's say Y. Let's say, Rob, I found the perfect number. It's called Y. Y is the largest number. Strictly less than one. I'm like, that's great. Now I solved the ultimatum game. It's so easy. But then I say to you, wait a second, consider the following number. Consider y plus 1 over 2. y plus 1 over 2. So y is strictly less than 1, which means that y plus 1 over 2 is strictly less than 1 as well. But it's also bigger than y. So you can't find a biggest number strictly less than 1, which means that I can't get to the top of this mountain. There is no best offer for state A to make. There is not an equilibrium where state B rejects when indifferent. There is no equilibrium like this. There's no equilibrium like this. There's no equilibrium like this. Because if state A offered 255, 256 and it got accepted, they'd still be saying, man, I could have offered 511, 512 and done strictly better. Then they offer 511, 512 and it gets accepted. And they're like, wait a second. I could have offered 1,023, 1,024 and do better. So they're always going to feel regret. No matter what, state A is going to feel regret. They make some acceptable offer and they walk away feeling regret, even though they have most of the pie. Because they could have done better. There is not an equilibrium where state B rejects when it's different. There is not a sub-game perfect equilibrium. There is not a backward induction surviving profile where state B rejects when it's different. There isn't one. Now, what if state B was accepting when indifferent? Let's consider the other contingency where state B accepts when indifferent. Let's go back to our mountain. Now, X equals zero, accepted. You get zero. X equals one half, accepted. You get one half. Three quarters, accepted. You get three quarters. Seven eighths, accepted. You get seven eighths. Fifteen sixteenths, accepted. You get fifteen sixteenths. One, accepted. You get one, and that's the top of the mountain.
In other words, this game has a unique sub-game perfect equilibrium, a unique backward induction surviving profile, where state A says, I'm keeping all of the pie, and state B says, fine. They would accept any deal that X is less than one or even X equals one. We have a very pliant state B. The only time that there's an equilibrium in this model when we take time into account is when state B accepts one indifferent. So in other words, in the unique prediction of the, of the ultimatum game, as I've shown it to you, state A gets everything. They have a pure first mover advantage. It's better to make the offers here. It's better to set the agenda. It's better to be the one that says, I take everything. Now, when people play this in the lab, first of all, people that are people that play the role of state B oftentimes reject, like just out of spite, right? Oftentimes the state B behavior is not very robust in the laboratory when it's like for a couple of dollars by an undergrad. But also people that are playing the role of state A rarely say I'm taking everything for myself. Why? Is that, a, is that an individual level thing? Would countries get that same thing? Would countries feel guilt? Would countries feel spite? It's a tough question. If it's true, it's outside of the model. We've written it down. If there is guilt or if there is spite, we would have to modify the model. But the way the humans play this game seems to have guilt and spite in there somewhere. This is an incredibly unfair outcome. If we're viewing this as a bargaining game, this means that we are now at the extreme point where state A has one happiness point and state B has zero happiness points. We are at the, at the extreme point of the triangle. And so here's a question. How would I get this outcome to be a little bit more fair? What change could I make to the model? What is the thing that could counteract this massive first mover advantage that state A has? What could I do? In, and I'm showing you this utility imputation space for a reason. I hope it gives you a clue. What change could I make to make state B a credible rejector enough, a credible enough rejector of deals that state A has to offer them something. What could I change to make state B do a little bit better? One only one thing. Pause the video. Welcome back to the three of you that went and got a Red Bull. Green tea is so delicious. So I would give I would give state B a better outside option. I would equip state B with some bargaining power. I would say DB isn't zero. DB equals one half. Suppose that we did the whole thing again with DB equals one half. Instead of DB equals zero, let's give some bargaining power to state B to counteract the first, mo first mover advance that state A has. Okay, now let's think about state B's decision rule. State B's decision is still a function. Now, consider if X is more than one half, if X is strictly more than one half, then one minus X is strictly less than one half and state B would reject. So now, if X is strictly greater than one half, state B will reject. So in other words, if, if, if you try to keep too much, if you try to keep more than one half, state B will reject. State B rejects anything where X is strictly greater than one half. Because one minus X will be strictly less than the one half they get for disagreeing now. If X is strictly less than one half, then one minus X is strictly greater than the one half that state B would get. And so state B would accept. So state B rejects any X's that are too high, accepts any X's that are low. If X is low, then one minus X is high and they would accept. And if X is equal to one half, then state B would accept or reject either way. If X equals one half, then one minus X equals one half, which renders state B indifferent. State B would be indifferent. For the same reasons as before, I'm going to say state B will accept when indifferent. I'm not assuming this. It's just that I know what will happen. There'll be a top of the mountain that I can't reach. So suppose that state B accepts when indifferent. They accept when X equals one half. They accept when X is less than one half. And they reject when X is greater than one half. Now let's think about state A's decision. Let's go back to the mountain. So if state A offers anything greater than one half, if they go too far to the right, here's one half. If state A offers anything greater than one half, it gets rejected and state A gets zero happiness points. So they're down here. Now the mountain do doesn't keep going. Now there's a cliff. If you offer too high of an offer, state B is going to reject it and now you're stuck. If X equals zero, it gets accepted and you get zero happiness points if you're state A. If X equals a quarter, that's less than one half. That gets accepted and you get a quarter of a happiness point. And so on, all the way up, the X equals one half, which because state A is 
is because state B is accepting it, X equals one half, that gets accepted. And then state A gets one half of a happiness point. And that's the top of the mountain. So state, state A would say X equals one half, that gets accepted. That's what you would see. But what you don't see is the fact that state B accepts anything that's good enough and rejects things that are too bad. So all of what's happening in state B land is reinforcing where the top of the mountain is for state A. The hypothetical, the infinite hypothetical worlds of state B's decision reinforce where the top of the mountain is for state A and therefore what offer they'd like to make. So now I've got an outcome where state A gets one half of a happiness point and state B gets a half of a happiness point. It just goes to show that in institutions where some people can move first and some people can move second, or under anarchy where some people get the first mover advantage by moving fast, the way to counteract first mover advantages, be they institutional or organic, is to have good bargaining power. That will neutralize any possibility of first mover advantage rendering you with nothing. The ultimatum game and all of its beauty. First mover advantage, huge but counteractable with bargaining power. That's pretty cool, right? So in the C block, I've got one more thing to show you about how to handle information sets. See you there. So here in the C block, I want to study that rule of law game that I showed you last week. So let me just get it queued up. We're running a little bit low on time, and so I don't want to spend all my time talking through the model. Go back to the last video if you need to. The basic idea is at the beginning of time, the ruler can either repress the people or not repress the people. No matter what happens, after that, faction A can either protest or not protest, and faction B can either protest or not protest. And the idea is that if they both manage the protest, then they throw the bastard out. However, if one and only one faction tries to, to throw the ruler out, then they have to pay a penalty for protesting without a friend. And a lot of this depend. then the final utilities depend on whether or not the, the ruler has decided to take from the people or not take from the people. You'll remember I have this information set structure where faction B can't tell what faction A did. So the idea is that faction B at each information node, at each of their two information nodes, information sets, they make one and only one choice. And faction A knows that. Faction A knows that faction B can't see what they do. So I want to introduce the concept of a subgame. So what's a subgame? A subgame is a subset of the game, as you may have guessed from the name. So it's a subset of the game. It's a subset of the nodes that follow certain rules. And here are some of the rules that it follows. A subgame has to start from a unique decision node. Okay? So a subgame can't start from two nodes. We begin from one decision node. It has to end only in terminal nodes, so I can't like just take out one sliver and not get to the ending. So it has to start from one decision, and it has to go only to terminal nodes, and it cannot break any information sets apart. So what I want to show you is that this game has three subgames. Three subgames. The first subgame begins from state A's decision after repression has happened. Notice that I've got a subgame here. What's happening? I've got a unique starting decision node, state A's decision node. I end only in terminal nodes, and I respect this information set that state B has. This is a subgame. If I had only used state B's decision nodes, it wouldn't be as, if I had just said over here, that wouldn't be a subgame because I would be breaking apart this information set. I can't tear apart information sets. I have to keep them whole. So the smallest subgame in this game begins from, from faction A. Did I say state B? Jeez. I'm so sorry. Right? So, so, so this is a sub game. I can't break it apart. This is the smallest strategic unit of this game. There's another sub game. And that sub game begins from faction A's decision after repression hasn't happened. Notice that this again starts from faction A's decision, goes only to terminal nodes, and respects the information set for faction B. And you're like, well, that's okay, where's the last subgame? The whole game is a subgame. It begins from the ruler, a unique starting node. I have not torn apart any information sets, and I end it all at terminal nodes. What makes a subgame perfect equilibrium, a subgame perfect equilibrium, is that there's a Nash equilibrium played at every subgame, 
And then subgames that rely on smaller subgames have to pay attention to the Nash structure in the smaller subgames. Let me show you what I mean. So let's begin from the subgame, uh, the small subgame in the north, where faction A is making a decision after the ruler has repressed. So I have this subgame here, and faction B can't tell what faction A does. So this game, this subgame, might as well be simultaneous. Because faction B doesn't get to observe the things that happened prior, so it might as well be simultaneous. So let me convert this to a matrix game. So let's have faction A be the row player, and let's have faction B be the column player. I'll put in the, the ruler's utilities as well, but they're not going to be at play right now. Faction A can either protest or not protest, and faction B can either protest or not protest. If both factions protest, it's zero happiness points for the ruler, eight for the citizen, eight for faction A, and eight for faction B. If faction A protests and faction B doesn't, well, now that means eight happiness points for the ruler, one happiness point for faction A who protested without a friend, and two happiness points for faction B. If faction A doesn't protest and faction B protests, then it's the same in reverse. Eight happiness points for the ruler, two happiness points for faction A, and one happiness point for faction B. Finally, over here in the situation where neither protested, eight for the ruler and two apiece for the factions. So this is a subgame. I have now taken this subgame and I have made it a, a matrix game. And so what I'm saying is, in order for a particular strategy profile to be a subgame perfect equilibrium, it needs to be Nash in every subgame. So we need to find the Nash equilibria of this subgame. And then we'll use them in tandem with the other parts of the game to figure out what we think might happen. So let's just put some stars in for faction A and faction B. Don't look at the first numbers, those belong to the ruler. There's a reason that I have them in, in the colors that don't match with the, with the rest of the game. So suppose that faction A knew that faction B was going to protest. Well, they could either protest and get eight happiness points or not protest and get two. They would rather protest. So I'll put a star underneath that eight. However, if faction A knew that faction B wasn't going to protest, then they could either protest and get one happiness point or not protest and get two. They'd rather not protest. They'll get two happiness points there. So I'll put a star underneath the two for don't protest, don't protest. What about faction B? Well, if faction B knew that faction A was going to protest, then they can either protest and get eight happiness points or not protest and get two. They would rather protest, that gets them eight happiness points. Finally, if faction B knew that faction A was going to not protest, then they can either protest and get one happiness point or not protest and get two. They'd rather not protest. Observe that we have two pure strategy Nash equilibria of this subgame. The one where both factions protest and the one where both factions don't protest. We'll have to consider both possibilities, just like we considered both possibilities for, for state B in the B block when they were indifferent. We'll have to consider both possible equilibria, because we don't know which of these is going to happen. We can't rule out protest, protest, or don't protest, don't protest. Let's go down to the southern subgame, the world where, where the ruler did not repress. To simplify the analysis somewhat, I'm going to say that if the citizens both protest, even though there wasn't repression, they had to pay a cost because they're doing something senseless. I'm just doing this as a modeling decision on my end. So we'll say that if, 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 the, if the ruler doesn't repress and then both factions protest, we'll say zero for the ruler and seven apiece for the factions. That keeps life a little bit simpler for reasons that you'll see in a second. So I can make a matrix version of this subgame. Faction A can either protest or not, and faction B can protest or not. If, if both factions protested, zero for the ruler and seven apiece for simplifying reasons for the two factions. Otherwise, if, if faction A protests and faction B doesn't, two for the ruler, seven for faction A, and eight for faction B. It, same in reverse, if faction B doesn't, if faction A doesn't protest and faction B does, that's two, eight, seven. And finally, if neither faction protests, that's two, eight, eight. The reason I chose this one is to, so that we would have a simple, unique Nash equilibrium where neither, neither faction wants to protest. Right? So the best response in both cases is always to not protest. And so we have a unique Nash equilibrium in the southern subgame where uh, neither faction protests. That gets two for the ruler and eight apiece for the citizens. So now I can consider these, not decision nodes, but rather these subgames solved. Consider those solved. So now that I've solved these small subgames, I can go back to the beginning of time, the ruler's decision, where they're looking down the tree, instead of thinking about little Plinko chip decisions made by each of the factions, now they're thinking about credible mutual best response behavior in terms of these interdependent factions. So now the ruler has to be thinking about different combinations of possible equilibria that they foresee. 
And the reason this is a little bit tricky is that what happens off the path has to reinforce what happens on the path. Hypotheticals have to reinforce realiza realizations of reality. So what the ruler wants to do depends on which equilibrium they expect to see happen in the world where they repress. Let me show you what I mean. So suppose for now that we chose the protest-protest equilibrium in the northern subgame. Suppose that the ruler was of the belief that if she repressed, then the two factions would manage to coordinate and they would both protest, and then the ruler would get zero happiness points. That's an equilibrium. That's a possible thing for them to consider. So for now, lock in the situation where the ruler, if they protested, the, the two factions would manage to protest together. So now the ruler is thinking to themselves, I can either repress thinking that they're both going to protest and I get zero happiness points. Or I can not repress and get two happiness points for sure. I would rather not repress. So here's an equilibrium. Up in this subgame, both factions protest. Down in this subgame, both factions don't protest and consequently, the ruler doesn't repress. There's a credible threat of protest that stops them from repressing. What happens in the hypothetical world if repression had happened reinforces the decision to not protest. Conversely, suppose that if we, if the ruler repressed, suppose that the two factions played the equilibrium, don't pro protest, don't protest. That's an equilibrium too. We have to consider that. Well, if that were to happen, if, if when the ruler repressed, if both factions didn't repress, then the ruler would get eight happiness points for a successful repression. So now the ruler is thinking, I can either repress expecting no protests and get eight happiness points, or I can not and know I get two happiness points for sure. Now they would rather repress. So whether or not the ruler chooses to repress depends on which equilibrium they expect to see happen in the subgame that would occur if they repressed. Something about equilibrium selection in that subgame is completely determinative of what the ruler is going to wind up doing. What happens off the path must reinforce what happens on the path. The world that we see is reinforced by the worlds that we don't see. Pretty intense, right? So this game has two pure strategy subgame perfect equilibria where every subgame sees Nash behavior happen. In the first of these, the ruler does not repress. If repression had happened, both factions would protest. And if repression doesn't happen, then neither faction protests. We need a complete contingency plan. You need to tell me every choice that would be made at every possible decision node. You're going to be very tempted in your problem sets to just describe the equilibrium path, but that is insufficient. The equilibrium path, the actual path of play that winds up happening, the fact that we see no repress, no protest, no protest, that isn't the whole story. We need to know what happens up here too. What happens off the path reinforces what happens on the path. So make sure that you tell me everything. A strategy in a game like this is a complete contingency plan. Imagine that what happened is somebody shows you a drawing of the game and says, tell me what you would do with each of your decision nodes in a sealed envelope. Give me a complete contingency plan. So that's the first subgame perfect equilibrium. The one that where there's a credible threat of deterrence for some equilibrium selection reasons. There's another subgame perfect equilibrium. That's the one where the ruler represses. If the factions are repressed, then neither of them protests. And if the factions are not repressed, then neither of them protests. This is another complete contingency plan. It's the one where the lack of a credible threat of protest has failed to deter, that means that the ruler has not been deterred from repressing. The, f the expected failure to coordinate means that the ruler feels free to repress. Now, what would be the reasons for one equilibrium selection or the other? It's a good question. There isn't one answer to that. What do you think makes it easier for factions to coordinate? Do they speak the same language? Do they have shared history? Are they allies? Are they in the same place? Are they in the same part of the country? What would make coordination hard for these two factions? Are they remote? Do they lack technology? Do they speak different languages? Do they have different religions? Do they hate one another? Do they have a lot of enmity? So what the ruler winds up doing depends on their expectations about what will happen depending on these two factions. And that seems to be a function of things that live outside of just the game. That's where you need a smart analyst to say, a focal point kicks in. 
or something about their shared history kicks in, or something else. The game can only tell you so much. We don't have a complete, a completely unique equilibrium, but if you're smart in any given context, it shouldn't be that hard to figure out what might happen. So that's subgame perfection, which is the fullest realization of credibility. We'll see that subgame perfection can be taken even further next week, but this should be enough to get you going. I hope that you see that credibility depends on looking down the tree, foreseeing all of the possible worlds, and then figuring out which possible world is best for you, so that the, the, the hypothetical worlds reinforce the world that you see right now. So what do we talk about today? We talked about credibility. We talked about what it is to look down the tree and say, whoever's making decisions down the tree is going to do what's best for them, and I shouldn't expect them to do something otherwise. That could be good or bad. It could be that you look down the tree and see that somebody actually isn't going to start a war with you if push comes to shove. And so you say, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to issue a threat. Or it could be that you look down the tree and you see a very pliant bargaining partner and say, you know what, I'm going to take the whole pie and not leave anything for them. Or it could be that you look down the tree and you're not quite sure what to expect, and so you have to consider both contingencies. Do the factions manage to cooperate with one another, or do they not? So there's a lot of different ways to see the future, and a lot of different ways that those different ways of seeing the future influence our decisions today. There's a reason that I got so worked up last week. It's hard to think through. It's hard to know what causation means in such a complicated world, even a world that's simple enough to put on this screen. When you see things that way, it's, it, you feel very humiliated because you understand exactly what's happening, but then a different, deeper kind of indeterminacy kicks in. Because last week's provocative thought was so provocative, it's only so deep that I want to go this time. The thing that I find most interesting from today's lecture is actually from the B block. I just love the ultimatum game, and I feel like I learn something more about it every time that I teach it. And so it's with the ultimatum guy in mind that I'd like to conclude with a provocative thought. Sometimes you see people in the literature refer to a particular kind of behavior as cooperative and other kinds of behavior as demandy. Sometimes states can either cooperate or demand. That seems to be a way that many people see the world. You're either sort of a, a pleasant sort of person or a not-so-pleasant sort of person. A pleasant country or not-so-pleasant country. Somebody is, is feeling demandy or they're not feeling demandy. And that's always struck me as kind of weird. I don't know what it is for somebody to be demandy versus somebody to not be demandy. What is cooperative behavior versus not cooperative behavior? You know, if, if you study games long enough, you say, well, what they're doing is the same. It just depends on what sort of environment they find themselves in. Whether somebody is cooperative or not so cooperative depends on what sort of interaction they're embedded in. Right? In the stag hunt, cooperation is possible. In the prisoner's dilemma, it's not. Does that mean that one rational player is cooperative and the other isn't? No, it just means that they're playing different games. And so the ultimatum game is interesting in the sense that we force state A to be very selfish. They make this take it or leave it offer to state B. And because of first mover advantage, they're able to really do well. As long as state B doesn't have a whole lot of outside option, as long as state B's bargaining power isn't very strong, state A can get a whole lot of the pie. Remarkably, state A's outside option doesn't matter that much. It matters a little bit, but it doesn't matter a whole lot. It's not nearly as determinative of the outcome as state B's outside option. So the person that has to accept or reject deals is the person whose outside option is ultimately more important. Does that mean that they're acting cooperatively or demandy? What would it mean for them to act cooperatively or demandy? Is it the fact that they accept or reject when indifferent? That seems like a very knife-edge case to sort of be staking claims about kinds of behavior on. And there's actually something much deeper at work, if you can believe it. So here's an interesting thing. Suppose that state A and state B didn't have a game in front of them. Suppose that state A and state B just knew that there was some pie that could be divided. And they knew that if they failed to reach an agreement, then they would be stuck at the disagreement point. Suppose they had a bargaining problem, but they didn't have a protocol. They didn't know what the protocol was. So now I've embedded them in an environment that is bargaining. It's a realist environment. There are no opportunities for win-win among the good outcomes. But I haven't said anything about the structure of the interaction. I haven't said state A makes it take you to leave it offer to state B, or that there's infinite horizon alternating offers, or anything else. I haven't said what they will do. I haven't named action sets. I haven't drawn a tree. All that I've said is, 
There's a bargaining problem with a disagreement point. Now, because of that, that means that my claim, the cooperative or demandy behavior is endogenous to the structure of the game, no longer has bite because I have not yet announced a structure of the game. In the absence of a game, my argument is stupid. My argument doesn't make any sense if there isn't a game to talk about because I said whether somebody is nice or nasty depends on what game they're playing. So I can't yet characterize what state A or state B play like. I haven't said anything about what they seem like to me. And there isn't a game for me to try to adjudicate with respect to. Here's something interesting. If you go, a little, if you go deeper into the theory of games, you wind up in a related class of interactions. You wind up in something called mechanism design, where the idea is if you knew the players and you knew what they wanted and you didn't yet have a game, what game would you write down to try to attain some outcome? If you could choose the game, if you could try to find the optimal game with respect to some criterion, find the fairest game or find the best game from state A's perspective or find the best game from state B's perspective or some mix of the two, find the best game. Solve for the best game. Don't solve the game solve by finding a game. Not, here's a game, go find the solutions, but rather, here's a problem, tell me which game gets me where I want to go. Here's something remarkable. If you let either state choose which game they would write down to navigate this bargaining problem, they would choose an ultimatum game. If there wasn't yet a game, and you said, guys, which game would you like? They would say, give me the ultimatum game. That's kind of interesting, right? Because that means that my view, that whether somebody is nice or nasty is endogenous, they're, they're capable of both and it depends on what environment they find themselves in. That actually might be wrong. And the reason that it might be wrong is that if we let them choose the game, they would choose a nasty game. They would choose the ultimatum game where they move first. They would choose the ultimatum game where they have first mover advantage. They would rig it. It seems to me that that's a far more pernicious kind of nastiness. Now it's not just you find yourself embedded in some environment. You know, Katniss wasn't nasty in the Hunger Games. She was just playing the Hunger Games. She found herself in the Hunger Games and she played them. Right? So if somebody gave her a game to play, she did what was best for her in the context of that game. If she had had volition over the game, like she does in Mockingjay, if she had had volition over the game, then she probably wouldn't have chosen that game in the first place. And what I'm saying to you is, if the states were allowed to choose the game, they would choose the ultimatum game. In other words, when we're talking about what sort of institutions to create to solve our bargaining problems, if we had our druthers, we would choose the institution that favored us the most. So what's nastier? Playing nasty in a game that you've been handed or choosing a game that favors you to begin with? My sense, my belief on this, and I could be wrong, is that the, the latter is the, is the worst one. That seems far worse to me. Choosing to write down a game that favors you. That seems nastier to me. I'm not sure why, it's na why it seems nastier to me. I'm not sure. I'm having to think about it as we go here, heaven forbid. I think part of it is that there's something organic about, be, about being embedded in a game. And then I say the sentence, the following sentence pretty often. I don't begrudge Katniss doing whatever she needs to to survive in the Hunger Games because she was put there. I don't begrudge her that. But would I begrudge her the ability to write down a game that favored District 12 to begin with? Would I begrudge powerful states the ability to write down an institution that favors them by allowing them a security council to buffer outcomes at the United Nations. Would I begrudge them that? That's a tough question. Would you begrudge powerful states the ability to do that? So here's an interesting question. If you don't begrudge states being nasty in games that have been handed to them, but you do begrudge them being nasty when you write down games, why? Is it possible to, be, to not begrudge states being nasty when they, when they play in games and also not begrudge them being nasty when they write down games. Does one imply the other or vice versa? When are you okay with nasty behavior and when are you not okay with nasty behavior? That's really tough. 
Because if I'm okay with being with people being selfish and nasty when they get put into the Hunger Games, then why would I why wouldn't I be okay with them being nasty when they're writing down a game to begin with? That's certainly how anarchy seems to feel on the subject, in as much as anarchy feels anything. That's really tough, right? And there isn't a right answer. It's just one of those little puzzles that emerges. From a normative standpoint, why is it okay to be nasty in a, inside a game but not outside of one? Is it because we're the gods of the games that we write down? And therefore, we're the, we're the game makers. And therefore, we don't begrudge people that we're sort of the gods of their world. But then once we equip them with similar power, then suddenly we want to ask them to become, become scrupulous? That seems weird. That seems like a trap. That seems like we trap them. Doesn't seem like we trap them. I don't want to trap them. They seem like nice countries. They're doing their best. All this goes to show that anarchy doesn't really care. Anarchy doesn't care when you're nasty. Anarchy doesn't care if you're nasty or meta-nasty or meta-meta-nasty. It's turtles all the way up. It's just food for thought. None of this is going to tell you how you feel about any given interaction. But part of the joy of thinking deeply on these things is it allows you to think in the meta. It allows you to have these thought experiments about how you feel about different levels of nastiness. Similarly, it might tell you how you feel about different levels of niceness when it happens to emerge. I don't begrudge prisoners doing their best in their dilemmata, and I don't think I would begrudge them doing their best when they decided whether or not to put down separate interrogation chambers. But I could change my mind about that tomorrow. It's not hard to imagine. Thankfully, our model is now rich enough to allow for a tomorrow for me to change my mind. I hope that you'll change your mind many times too. One of the fun things about experiencing education over time is you get to change your mind often. You get to reflect, observe, update. Continue to do so as much as you can. Thankfully, we have a few more weeks of further rumination together. I'm looking forward to that. In the meantime, thanks for watching.